Welcome to part two of our unit five cognition unit. Today what we're going to be talking about is forgetting and memory construction. Now most of the conversation is going to be about forgetting um, and really about why do we forget, what happens, what are the different causes of it. We'll also spend a little bit of time talking about how memory is constructed and we'll get into that a little bit later and that'll tie into you know one of the also one of the reasons why we forget sometimes. We're going to talk about this more in uh, actual class, but there are people who have what are considered exceptional memories or prodigious memories. There's a lot of different ways and types that this can be expressed, and we'll look at this more in the individual differences and testing unit when we talk about things like savants or people like savants. Um, but there are people who have uh, things like photographic memories or perfect recall um, that would be considered exceptional or prodigious. Now, this is a quote just to kind of get us thinking about memory and forgetting a little bit differently. So usually I think forgetting has a very negative connotation. When you think about forgetting, it's pretty much always seen as a negative thing. Um, this quote is just, if we remember everything, we should on most occasions be just as ill off as if we remembered nothing. So just kind of a way to think about, you know, there is a lot of the things that we do forget that maybe it's not necessarily horrible to forget. And remembering every second of every day you know, might be just as bad as forgetting a lot of it like we do normally. So just kind of a little bit different way to think about memory and forgetting. So let's start talking about some of the more um, important stuff for what we're doing here in class. So the first two pieces I want to talk about are amnesia. And there's really two main types. Um, we have anterograde amnesia and retrograde amnesia. Now these are both really important, especially anterograde, um, because they not only teach us about memory in general, but they also confirm some of the things that we talked about in our first day about how memory works and how it's stored and how it's created. So amnesia is basically just forgetting, being unable to remember something. Now anterograde amnesia is where we have the inability to form new memories. So usually there's some sort of event that causes it, some sort of um, brain uh, damage or catastrophic thing that happens uh, to certain parts of your brain that then cause anterograde amnesia. And basically from that point when that happens, let's say you're in a car accident, from that the moment of that car accident, you are unable to form new memories. So you still remember who you are, you still remember you know when you were a kid growing up, you remember what you were doing that day, but after that moment, you're unable to form new memories. Now, it's not necessarily like instantaneous. You might remember, you know, chunks of time, minutes of time, hours of time. But for the most part, you're not going to be able to go past, you know, a day. Um, you're going to basically be, you know, unable to remember something that far back or that, that new, I guess, would be what it was. Um, now, one thing that's really interesting about this is uh, even though those pe these people are unable to form new memories, they are still able to learn skills, um, nonverbal skills though. Now, what's really important about this is you would assume that I wouldn't be able to form any new skills because I need to remember how to do the skill. I need to remember whatever that thing is that I'm doing. And why this is really important is it confirms the separation of explicit and implicit memories that we talked about before, right? Our um, effortful and automatic processing. So what's basically happening is our explicit memories are, we're unable to form explicit memories with anterograde amnesia. I'm unable to make new memories of pieces of information or uh, events in my life that are brand new. But my implicit memory does still function. So I'm still able to learn a task if it's nonverbal, but I won't remember how. And that's kind of an interesting piece. So they'll be able to learn new tasks, right? You can see that right here, but they can't explain why they're able to do that task. They can't explain how they know how to do something. So they can somebody could teach you something, you'd be able to do it, but you wouldn't know why you're able to do it. So again, anterograde amnesia is really, really important. Um, not only you know for understanding amnesia, but also for understanding how our memory normally works. Um, an example of anterograde amnesia um, is Fifty First Dates. If you've seen the film, um, she has anterograde amnesia, where she's unable to form new memories. 
we also have uh, what is called retrograde amnesia. Now, retrograde amnesia is more like the classic amnesia that you think of. Usually when someone, um, whether it's a movie or a TV show or real life, you know, says something about amnesia, they're referring to retrograde amnesia. Retrograde amnesia is the inability to retrieve information from the past. So generally speaking, again, there's a certain moment in time where this will start or a chunk of time specifically in your past that you're missing that you are unable to retrieve the information from. So if you've ever seen um, like any of the Bourne movies like Jason Bourne, he has retrograde amnesia. So he's still able to learn new things. He's still able to make new memories. He remembers things after a certain point in time, but he's unable to remember things before that chunk of time. Right? So that's the difference. Retrograde is going back. It's retro. We're going back. We can't remember things from the past. And terrograde is going forward. We're unable to remember things going forward. <clears throat> now, this is going to get us into a little bit more of the reasons why we forget. Now, obviously, we don't all have amnesia. Um, so why do we forget things? What are the th causes? And what we're basically going to see is a connection to the different steps or stages or processes in our information processing model. So in that model, if you remember, we have um, our encoding, we have our storage, and we have retrieval. And basically what we know is that in each of those processes, there can be problems or errors that happen that cause us to forget. The first one is encoding failure. Encoding failure is super simple. You probably don't even necessarily think about it as forgetting, but it technically is. The idea is, is that the information was not encoded. So, for example, when someone's talking to you and you're not listening, and then they ask you what they said and you don't remember, that's encoding failure. You never knew the information to begin with. You never encoded it, brought it into your brain. So you obviously aren't going to be able to remember it. That's our first one. Pretty straightforward. We also have um, what's called storage decay. So again, this goes into that second process of storage. And basically, this is the process of exactly what it sounds like, of memories fading, of memories decaying over time. So what we know is that once we remember something, once we have it in our brain, we've encoded it, um, it basically just falls apart a little bit over time. It fades. Now, that fading can be um, counteracted by doing different things. And we'll talk about that more next class when we talk about um, remembering or improving our memory. But if it just sits there, if it's, we don't ever use it, um, it will basically decay, right? And it's, again, especially happens when we are unusing or it's a piece of information that we are not using. We're not going back to it over and over again. Now, this actually happens at not necessarily a specific rate, but in a specific way. Uh, and we know that from... Uh, Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve. It's Herman Ebbinghaus is the psychologist that did it. And what he found is this curve right here. This is actually exactly what it looks like. So at the beginning, we encode a bunch of information and it's 100%, right? There's all the information that we learned is, you know, what we encoded. So that's 100% of the information. And within 20 minutes, we forget mm, about 40% of that in, within 20 minutes. And this probably makes sense. You know, when you're in class, and um, you walk out of, well, now you're not walking out of class, but you leave the meet and um, you go to your next class or whatever. If 10, 20 minutes later, you start thinking back about, okay, what did I learn in that class? You don't remember everything. Even when you watch these videos, if you, you know, took a second and quizzed yourself at the end of the video, you would probably forget a big chunk of what you learned already. So within 20 minutes, we forget about 40% of everything we learned. By the end of the day, that's dropped to, you know, closer to 70%. So um, there's a really rapid drop off of information. So we lose about 70% of the information that we have encoded during the day, you know, in uh, like a day later, basically is the idea. One day later. Now, what we see after that is it basically levels off. Now, you can see it's still going down a little bit, but it's not very much, right? The difference between one day and 31 days a month is not very much, you know, 5% maybe. So, um, again, there's this initial drop off and then it levels off. So if you remember something after a day, 24 hours later, 
it's very likely you'll remember it 31 days later. And again, this will come in, in handy when we start talking about how do we improve our memory. Because again, if I can start you know, remembering things here 24 hours later, that means, okay, here it's probably still going to be there. Now, in addition, we also have retrieval failure. Now, there is going to be a lot of different pieces that are in this retrieval part. So encoding failure is basically the main portion or the main problem with encoding. Um, the storage decay is going to be the main problem generally with storage. Now, retrieval, there's going to be a, a, a quite a few different things that can go wrong here. <clears throat> and again, what we're doing is at this point, we're trying to reach back and retrieve that information and pull it back into our consciousness. So retrieval failure is just struggles or the inability to retrieve information that was encoded and was stored. So this is assuming it's something you learned and you remembered at least for a period of time. It's something that you know, it's in your brain, it's in there somewhere, but you're unable or you're struggling to pull that out, to bring it back into our consciousness. The easiest example of this is what is called the tip of the tongue phenomenon. You've probably heard of this before. The tip of the tongue phenomenon is where I'm trying to remember something. So maybe it's a word for class. Maybe it's a person's name. Maybe it's the name of a band or a song. And I can't remember it, but it feels like it's there. That's why they call it the tip of the tongue. Like it's right there. You, you can almost like feel that the, that the information is there, but you just can't quite get it. That's this tip of the tongue. And it, it comes with the, this feeling. The feeling part is kind of important. Um, this feeling of, oh, I, I, I'm almost going to remember it. I almost have it. That's the tip of the tongue phenomenon. So again, it's this uh, failing to retrieve something, but just that feeling that you're really, really close, that you almost have it or you're right there or there's something nearby. Um, a lot of times, too, like you might be, well, might be able to remember like a rhyming word or you might be able to remember like a similar band, but you're just like not quite there. That's the tip of the tongue phenomenon. And again, this is retrieval failure. The information's in there. You do know, but you just can't quite get to it. <clears throat> we also have what is called proactive and inter I'm sorry, and retroactive interference. Proactive and retroactive interference. Now, I want to, uh, after I get, go through the definitions of these, I want to set up the example um, actually from your, uh, like a laptop, like a password. So proactive interference is the forward acting disruptive effect of older learning on the recall of new information. So older learning messing up new information. Retroactive interference, if you can kind of guess from the name, is the opposite. It is the backward acting disruptive effect of new learning on the recall of old information. Okay, so they're going opposite directions. So I want you to think about uh, the passwords you use for whatever, your, your computer, your Google login, all that kind of stuff. And I'm sure for a lot of you, you use basically the same password. But let's imagine that you have the exact same password for everything. Okay, all of your logins, everything is the exact same password. Now, you have this password for a long time. You've got it memorized, super simple. It comes up every single time. But eventually... Um, you have to change the password on one of your sites. Let's say uh, for your Gmail, you have to change your Gmail password for whatever reason. It doesn't really matter. So you change your Gmail password. And then a few days later, you need to log into your Gmail. And all of a sudden you go to log in and you put in the old password. And you try it over and over again. It doesn't work and you can't remember why. That's proactive interference. It is um, old information, my old password, getting in the way of the new information. Now, you still know your new password. You remember it. But that old piece of information is getting in the way. Now, again, retroactive interference is going to work the opposite. So let's say now you've got this new password, um, you know, and you, you've logged into your Google and everything's good. Right? You logged into your Gmail. And now you need to go back and you need to log into something else. Let's say Facebook. you got to log into your Facebook. Now, your Facebook is still your old password. But when you go to log in, you put in your new password. That would be retroactive interference. So that's where new information is getting in the way of something old. So again, proactive is old getting in the way of new. Retroactive is new getting in the way of old. All right, and again, these are both types of retrieval failure. 
We can also talk about what is called repression. Now, we'll have a little bit more of a discussion about repression when we talk about um, psychoanalytics and the psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic theory and Freud uh, a little bit later on in the year. Um, but we will spend a little bit of time talking about repression now because it is technically a type of retrieval failure. So what repression is, is basically it comes specifically from a specific type of theory, which is psychoanalytic, uh, which is all about um, these urges and kind of subconscious needs that are, you know, pushing us towards certain things that are unconscious. And what repression is, is a defense mechanism, they believe, that is blocking off certain things. So it's blocking off um, something that is makes you anxious, something that makes you afraid, um, certain thoughts, feelings, memories. That's repression. That's the idea of repression. So it would kind of be like if um, maybe something like maybe you almost drowned when you were a little kid and you um, are incredibly afraid of pools, but you don't know why. That might be an example of what a psychoanalytic thinker would say is repression, that you are blocking off that memory to protect yourself. Now, to be really clear, um, and we do spend a lot of time talking about psychoanalytic stuff a little bit later, most psychoanalysis stuff people don't really practice anymore. Um, you can see that down here, right? Most memory researchers don't think repression really happens very often. Maybe here and there it happens a little bit. Um, some of them will even say there's no such thing as repression. That's not a real thing. So it is something that will come up on the AP psych test that they'll ask about, but it's not quite something that necessarily is um, scientifically, you know, stamped in stone or anything like that at this point. Now, that's going to get us to reconsolidation. Um, and this is where we start talking about memory construction errors. Now, one of the things, and, and we'll talk about this a little bit more um, as we go <clears throat> or in class, is memor how memory actually works is very different than how you probably imagine it. So what you probably imagine is that, let's say I have a memory of um, playing soccer with my dad. And that's this memory that's in, that's I remember from when I was a little kid. What you probably imagine is that you have kind of like this picture, you know, this little tiny movie or whatever that's in your brain somewhere that your, no, your neurons go back, you know, when they find. And when you think of it, it pulls that picture up and it's a perfect copy of um, what actually happened or what you actually experienced. The reality is that's not how memory works. We actually construct memories. And this is, I'm reading kind of this off the second bullet point here. Um, so memory is retrieved by inferring from our past stored information and adding what we later imagined, expected, saw, and heard. So what's really happening when you remember something is you are building it. You're literally constructing that memory every single time. So every time you remember it, you're putting it together from scratch again. And you're adding together all these different pieces. Now what that means is that those memories might not be perfect. And that over time, they can actually change. Um, and that's what reconsolidation is. So reconsolidation uh, is a process in which previously stored memories, when retrieved, so we've gone back and remembered them, are potentially altered before being stored again. So let's say, for example, um, and actually maybe I can give you an example. We'll talk about this a little bit later as well when we talk about development. Um, but if you think right now and try and think back to your earliest memory, the very, very, very first thing you can remember, as you're kind of picturing that, right, and I want you to try and picture it as well as you can, the reality is that the majority of you are picturing a false memory, that whichever you're imagining right now did not actually happen or you don't actually remember it. But it feels very, very real because, again, we construct it. And this is where we can construct all sorts of things. So this is why, um, so I know, for example, like there's a story that I can imagine when I was a little kid that... I realized over time, I don't actually remember happening, but I can remember it because I've heard the story over and over again. Because someone has told me this story about me as a little kid so many times that I, I can picture it even though it didn't actually happen. So again, we're adding in a whole bunch of information. And this happens every time we remember anything. So every time we remember something, every time we go back and retrieve it, 
no matter what it is, even if it's like something factual, there's this chance that we tweak it a little bit, right? That something happens, that we um, misremember something, or we change how we feel about it, or we change a specific thing that we saw or heard or that happened. And so over time, what can happen, especially if this is like a, a, a episodic memory, an event, over time, that event can look very, very different, right? Little changes over and over and over again can cause big changes at the end. And again, what's happening is, is the original memory, whatever that first thing is, is being replaced every single time. So every single time, that's why we have this GIF here, we're basically recreating a memory over and over and over and over and over again. So if you remember it perfectly, then it's going to stay the same. But if we don't, it might change every time a little bit. So that process is what's called reconsolidation. And it's really important with also just the idea of that fact that we are actually constructing memories. It's not just, you know, uh, like a computer that's going back and pulling a file up, right? We're basically remaking the file every single time. <clears throat> now we can see this uh, specifically, we can see how this memory is constructed through uh, the misinformation effect um, and also what's called the imagination effect, which are, are basically the same thing, um, just a little bit different uh, focus. So the misinformation effect occurs when misleading information distorts your memory. So um, where I can ask you a, a misleading question about something that happened and I can literally change your answer. I can literally change your memory by asking certain questions or asking them certain ways. So there's a really famous experiment that happened with this and uh, this is what we're seeing in the bottom right here. So uh, what they did was they showed people a video of a car accident. And in that car accident, this is what it basically looked like. Um, it wasn't a very, it wasn't a very big accident, right? There's just kind of more like a fender bender. Um, there wasn't, none of the windows broke, you know, they weren't going that fast. That's what happened. So um, when they asked people to reconstruct, tell us what happened, how fast were their cars going? Um, was there broken glass? Uh, you know, how bad do you think the damage was? Those kind of questions. Um, they would, you know, construct a, a relatively accurate picture of what happened. But if depending on how they asked the questions, they could change how they remembered it. So, for example, if they said about how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other, as opposed to saying about how fast were the cars going when they hit each other, people were, I can't remember the exact percentage, so I don't want to make one up, but were much more likely to say that they were going faster and much more likely to say that there was broken glass at the scene. Now, again, this is really important because what's happening is, is that it's showing us that when we add in information, even if it's something just like a question, there's not, we're not really telling you anything about what happened here. It literally changes our memory. And these people will stick by these memories. They will stick by and say, no, I'm positive I saw broken glass, even though it definitely wasn't there. Um, we'll watch like a little bit of a, uh, like a brain games example of this where they play with this a little bit. Um, of how they can kind of mess with um, our, our memory through misinformation. Now, um, this the imagination effect is basically the exact same thing, but it's just through imagining. So even repeatedly imagining non-existent actions can create false memories. So this is kind of goes back to what I was talking about before, where if you imagine something happening over and over and over again, you can actually create a false memory of it happening. And again, this plays into this idea that some of our memories are false, right? So like the one I brought up before where I said, try and imagine your first memory. Even if it feels super, super vivid, there is a decent chance that it's not a real memory. It still feels the same, even if it's something we've created, um, but it might be, you know, just completely false and it's just something you've imagined over and over again. It could be something that was at one point factual and actually happened, but now it's been tweaked and it looks entirely different. But we can see that through this misinformation and imagination effect. Um, we can also talk about what's called source amnesia and deja vu. Now these are kind of like separate uh, pieces. They are um, a little bit tied to retrieval as well, where it's basically a loss of information. Um, so source amnesia or source misattribution, they're basically the same thing, 
are where we remember something, but we don't remember how we know that something. So faults are memory of how, when, or where information was learned or imagined. So again, maybe you remember, um, for example, like you remember meeting someone and you remember their name. You know, you're like, oh, it's Jonathan. But then you go, how do I know Jonathan? You can't remember, like, where did I meet that person? Where do they come from? That's source amnesia. Source misattribution is basically the exact same thing, except for instead of not knowing, we misattribute it. So we think we met them at soccer practice, but actually we met them in sociology class or whatever. That would be source misattribution. Um, our next piece is deja vu. So deja vu, we'll talk a little bit more about. You can see the video that we're going to watch in class to talk about. Um, what it is, is this sense of feeling like you've experienced something already. That um, I feel like I've done this, I've been here, I've lived this before. That's what deja vu basically means. Now that video is going to talk a little bit more about um, why it happens. There's a few different theories about why we feel deja vu and how it happens. Um, but a main idea is that um, stuff that is currently happening to you is either triggering something that we've experienced earlier um, or that we're not paying attention to something. So we're like catching up. There's a few different ways, but basically there's um, unconscious kind of functions going on in our brain that are making us feel like, um, I've already experienced this. I've already been through this. I've done this before. When in reality, we haven't. Oops, why is it playing that video? Stop, please. Okay. Um, the last piece, and we'll, we'll get into this more. This will be kind of a big chunk of what we talk about in class, um, is false memories and eyewitnesses. So we're going to uh, watch a TED talk about this. That She's going to really de go delve into it a lot better than I can. Um, but I'm just going to kind of give you like a little bit of a teaser, I guess, with this. So... Um, they have what is called the Innocence Project. The Innocence Project is uh, uses DNA to basically check and make sure that um, people that are convicted of crimes were actually guilty. Now, generally speaking, they're focused on um, people that, you know, there wasn't necessarily very verifiable. They weren't DNA, like there wasn't hard scientific proof that it happened. A lot of times these are cases that are older too, so maybe the, the DNA... Uh, that they were using or the testing that they were using in the past wasn't as good as it is now. So we're going to try and rechest and check stuff. But one of the things we found through that is that um, since then they've freed, and I, this number has obviously changed, but um, at the time of me making the slide, they had freed, freed 337 people who were proven not guilty from by DNA. They were used DNA to prove that this was not the person that convicted that crime. Out of those 337, 71% <clears throat> were convicted because of faulty eyewitness identification, which means that 71% of that 337 number, somebody identified them. Some, an eyewitness said that is the person that committed this crime at some point. So again, um, we, as we talk about all these memory pieces, right? this is a really good example where a lot of times something like an eyewitness is seen as ironclad evidence that if someone saw you do a crime, that is like, you're for sure guilty. What we're finding is that the reality is our memories aren't as good as we actually think they are. Um, so she's going to talk a lot about, you know, how that happens and, and how we kind of combat that a little bit. Okay. So uh, if you would, please take a few moments, do a short summary, five or four to five sentences on forgetting and memory construction. See you next time.